and uh, I'm gonna, gonna uh, basically present some of the research we are trying to do it uh, within the two project, two uh, flood sandpit project, uh, by using a similar approach, what I call the flood footprint. And the the, the first uh, project is the uh, blue green cities, and the other one is Sesame project, looking at the uh, small and medium uh, business and their adaptations and uh, the damage to them in terms of flooding. Uh, I have a roughly 15 uh, slides. I try to keep it within 20 minutes. And I, what I will do is I will try to um, uh, talk about the methodology first and the uh, uh, two small applications we have done so far. One is for Sheffield cities, the other is for the European uh, countries. And I hope you enjoy. And if you have any questions, please type it in the uh, chat box and I can pick it up uh, in the end. I'm just going to get started. The flood footprint, basically we're trying to uh, spend a long, long time trying to give a definition for that. Although uh, it, it's, it's not perfect, it still is not uh, perfect. Uh, the key, the, the background for doing this flood footprint analysis, uh, what we invented this term, is basically we can see the flooding in one uh, local location can actually impact a lot large area even to the whole UK or the global economy. Trying to ignore those uh, knock-on effects, um, which means we, we may ignore the economic benefits and beneficiary for flood risk management event, inventations. Uh, uh, European, uh, sorry, the Environment Agency in 2007, for the 2007 flooding, they made some rough estimations saying that the flood cost into the economy directly is 3.2 billion. Um, but the wider impact can be can add another 50 to 250 percent on that, and we're trying to give a more robust methodology, trying to uh, quantify this type of uh, uh, indirect uh, impact. So, trying to make the direct and the indirect link together, basically the cascading effects through the supply economic supply chain together. Taking this together, what we describe as a flood footprint. I'm, um, I, well, I have spending 15 years of, on carbon footprint and water footprint studies. But when I came up with this flood footprint, I thought this is probably the most appropriate. Basically, the footprint is describe a major um, uh, impact or damage, and the flood as a natural disaster, uh, even storm or other hurricanes, these type of things. It, uh, when they, you know, use a footprint trying to. Uh, di uh, uh, describe this type of impact that's quite uh, uh, significant, uh, quite quite uh, quite appropriate. The flood footprint, uh, by using the current def definition from us, is is a measure of uh, the total economic impact that is directly and indirectly caused by flood events to the flood risk, but also to the wider economic systems. We are trying to also ex expanded it to a social, to try to measure some of the social impact, but may need to use a different methodology. I don't want to limit just flood footprint just to the economic side, but it can be also uh, social, potentially can be an environmental impact as well. Uh, if we only talk about the economic impact, flood footprint is measured by, by monitor, uh, monetary units, like say pound, sterling pound, or say percentage of GDP. Our regional uh, gross value added. So that's to give a uh, direct, say, uh, impact number to the policy or decision makers, saying what's the, uh, the amount of the money they lost without the event, how much they can save, and uh, the percentage of GDP can be saved, etc. Um, I have a, this is a diagram that shows, you know, to show what the flood footprint is. So, for example, you got a flood, flooding in one particular place on the right hand, uh, right hand side. Then you got the direct damage. For example, uh, the metro, the subway is, uh, you know, the underground is closed. Your lighting got a uh, electricity shortage, and the house is being flooded, etc. And rescue um, activities. And those things, uh, if they are closed down the railways or the uh, metros, they would have an impact through the whole supply chains because you can't travel, you can't perform any uh, 
uh, lock on uh, activities, cascading activities. For example, you can't catch a, flat, a flight anymore, then you cancel meetings, etc., along the supply chains. So all those, all those uh, indirect impact together, plus the direct impact, is captured as a, as a flux footprint. Um, so um, the, the factor we consider in the flux footprint analysis, for example, on the right, on the left hand side, this, uh, this is a pre-disaster uh, situation. Different dots means different type of organizations. The size of the dots means how big they are, for example, like that. Then you, they are all sort of linked in each other uh, within the with the supply chain, uh, you know, to each other. Suddenly, there's a flooding comes in, and those organizations being flooded, and or at least uh, the business kind of damaged or delayed, and the other type of the you know what's the impact to them? Uh, from direct impact analysis, there's no impact to them, but by looking at the uh, the indirect costs, they would have an impact because of the short of supply or or downstream consumers has an impact, etc. So uh, by doing this uh, economic uh, flood footprint analysis, we consider basic two uh, main uh, uh, capitals. One is the labor. So how many people, because of flooding, they have to stay at home or they, they delay in traveling to work. So they can't perform their productivity to perform any work. On the, on the other hand, is the capital loss. Uh, how much phys the physical capital uh, the capital for the machineries and also the public capital means the infrastructures, etc. So those capitals. Uh, what's the uh, the damage and what's the delay for uh, for doing to placing them, etc. So these are two big categories we do: labor and the capital uh, as a constraint to the uh, to, to calculate the flux point. Uh, the flow footprint based on uh, input-output analysis is not a conventional input-output analysis, but it's a different way of uh, uh, we, we, we converted the input-output analysis uh, to what we call adaptive imp regional input-output analysis. So this is based on the, the uh, input-output framework. I just have a, a brief word of input-output analysis. The input-output analysis is a cornerstone for the modern uh, uh, modern macroeconomy uh, is developed uh, by Vasily Leontiev. He, with, uh, by his uh, PhD uh, dissertation, because of his contribution to input output analysis, uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 1973. It's only the second year of the, the uh, they, they gave the uh, Nobel Prize to the economic subject. Um, then originally they used to try to identify the, uh, the unemployment rate after the war, and uh, later on, in, from 1970s, grow, a growing amount of literature looking at the environmental uh, crisis and the, and the relationship between economic and environmental uh, consequences. This uh, chart, the chicken chart, is basically uh, describe what are what is the input of the analysis. Um, you know that uh, you know the chicken uh, gets input from you know from the ground, the the incident or the bugs or whatsoever, and the output are X, uh, basically the economic output. And the, during here, in the, the the chicken itself, is describe a set of technologies. You know, is the Chinese chicken is different than the U.S. chickens, or the you know because of size of technology. So we say put put. So that gave us. Uh, from the uh, flooding perspective, in terms of recovery, how quickly we can recover, how your stomach can digest those uh, like uh, bad things like flooding, and uh, that set of technologies or the uh, the things we we will require, and this is described in the put put uh, things. Um, so uh, a little bit more about why we are using input output analysis. Basically, I/O analysis is grounded in a technology relation between production and consumption. It provides a full uh, accounting for for the all the inputs and the output we, we require. It's a powerful tool, and it's also a, a key part of uh, uh, many people may be familiar with the CG models. So the major, the central part is also of the CG model is the input output tables. 
And the I/O table is relatively simple compared to other like CG models, um, because because of the simple, uh, it's simple. This sh it's well connected or integrated with other engineering models or the flood models or the data we require. Uh, comparatively speaking, uh, CG models has a lot of the uh, um, things you have to consider, and it's not so uh, flexible to uh, connect, like to integrate with, uh, with the uh, engineering models. The flood footprint, um, uh, like the modeling framework, what we have here, um, it's complicated. Well, I just realized how complicated it can be, um, but. It's actually it's quite simple. I show you another uh, uh, like a diagram later on. It's, it describes the simple relationship. But I want to list the whole framework we are considered in the in calculating the flood footprint. Uh, each of the box we are we, we we have to get them in order to produce the the final output. Um, yeah, for, for, forgive me. I I made a mistake. So. The different color of the box be determining on the uh, uh, which stage of the uh, the the data or the modeling comes in. The final one is actually is the uh, uh, it's the green box. Right? I I forgot to change the color. Uh, so the final is the uh, the green one is what we calculate for the flood footprint. They calculate the direct loss and they calculate indirect loss. Uh, these two together is make the flood footprint, and then we can we can distinguish a flood footprint by sectors, by production sectors, and by regions. And we can calculate um, the the costs and the time in terms of flooding uh, after flooding recovery for for this. So we can give the uh, sector levels, and then we can give uh, uh, the spatial levels, and then, and also we can give a uh, time steps for each of that. But before we do that, the first step actually is the white boxes around here. So these are um, the damage, uh, well, to trying to introduce an event for flooding. And also, um, if we have, a, from policy perspective, if you have some adaptation pathways, adaptation um, recovery patterns, whatever set by the government, and we take that into consideration, and those would uh, uh, help us to determine the uh, the rec uh, recovery patterns in the uh, in the later stage. So those are the actual exogenous factors we have to take in. Once we got the damage data, then we configure the damage functions with some help with uh, with the flood modelers and uh, some. Uh, for example, in the UK, we have the multicolored menu. So we, we de determine the indirect damages. And then those direct damages would, uh, would uh, actually um, distinguish between residential damages and industry damages. And uh, then would uh, uh, give us uh, another thing, so what we call the event accounting matrix. But basically, they are direct, uh, they are uh, damage functions for that. After we get the damage functions, we, in, we, we run to the next stage. Trying to look at the uh, how trying to do a second secondary say uh, level of calculations to make the uh, uh, what's the productivity in terms of capital loss and what's the productivity in terms of labor loss etc. And those things would uh, become a constraint factors in the input output models. And then this uh, the blue part is the input output models basically. It, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, and this, uh, um, the, the, the diagram on the left gives you a more like a direct linkage between each other, between the I.O. models and the damage functions we make. After, so we use uh, flood inundation models on uh, like, uh, you know, output of flood inundation models and the colored menus, trying to, de trying to define the damage function on that. Um, and those damage functions, of course, can be can be parameters can be uh, further explained by uh, by some other uh, like for example in the uh, Sesame project we, we have a small business uh, small and medium business adoption plans these type of things those can be further uh, uh, like ad adjusted 
after we got the damage functions, as I said, industry residential, then capital availability and productivity, similarly on the labor. Once we, we, we got this part, we all put into the, uh, the, the I.O. models. Then they give us better results. They give us the wider economic impact per, per sector, as a sector level or as an aggregation level. We also have to make some assumptions. Uh, in the um, Sesame project we have to do for the Sheffield, for the blue green cities, we will need to do Newcastles. So I'm going to show you for the Sheffield the result for, uh, in a few minutes. Um, basically, the, uh, the IO models, uh, it's a macroeconomic model. In the UK, we are not very, very well uh, to the statistic office doesn't offer the IO model very, uh, you know, IO tables uh, very often or in uh, great details. So we have to work on, um, based on some mathematical um, model, what we call location quotients, to 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 zoom down, zoom in the uh, the uh, rock share and the Humber, uh, the Humber into the rock share city level. Not, sorry, it, not rock share city, Sheffield cities. Uh, let me just clear, clarify, it's a, it's a Sheffield city, not Sheffield city region. So they are quite different in terms of the admin boundaries. Uh, some other assumptions, for example, the physical damage distribution, uh, you know, we, we will get from urban uh, irrigation models. If not, we, we, will, we will have to make some assumptions. The damage in labor, like not the damage, like the amount of, uh, amount of uh, uh, labor not, uh, not available for work, we we quite hard to guess w which sector they work for, but we just uh, have a uniformly distributed uh, among the uh, the different sectors. So uh, based on the uh, GDP proportion, etc., you know we can do sensitivity analysis on that. Uh, again, and many other things, uh, reco recovery patterns, rationing skins. Uh, I want to mention here on the rationing skin. In the uh, for the recoveries, for the Russian schemes, we for the remaining amount of the capital or the labor loss, uh, the remaining about like say economic productivity, we always set the priori priorities to fix business to business links. So sector between the the links trade links between the business, because that's the quickest way to recover. Of course, in the reality, it's not always the uh, the real case. But let's look at an optimistic um, scenario. Of course, that things we run uh, sensitivity analysis on that. And on the import part, people may have uh, questions about how much import we can get. We set a constraint for the amount of import we can get. It's uh, it, it's directly against the uh, the uh, the the condition of the transportation sectors. So how much transportation sector can recover or uh, remains. And that's the amount of imports we can get. We thought it's a quite a reasonable assumption because uh, if you close an M62 uh, from Manchester to Leeds, then uh, pretty much uh, the, you know, your, 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 your transportation sector will re reduce quite a, quite a lot. Then uh, you got uh, the queue, uh, you know, the, uh, the lorries coming from, from uh, to Leeds uh, uh, from Manchester. That's quite limited. Um, so I'm showing you the, the some results we done for the. Uh, it's only a preliminary result. We are we are gonna refine, uh, uh, trying to do more tests later on. Uh, but for 2007 flooding in Sheffield, uh, direct damage for for flooding in Sheffield cities is 295 million, which is about 3.5 percent of Sheffield city GVA. Uh, uh, Gross value added. The indirect damage is about 276, and the total flood footprint is 6.8 percent, almost twice of the direct damage. And it took about 20 months to fully recover from two pre-disaster level. Uh, this is something I forgot to mention. When we talk about recovery in the flood footprint, we always try to against to pre-disaster level. Um, the the factor factor rate between direct damage and total flood footprint is one to two in this case, but you can see it in other regions um, later on when we do the European levels. It's a much bigger regions. The the flood footprint and the direct damage 
uh, sector is is about four to five, four to six. So the flood footprint is, is a four times bigger than the barrier damage. Just because um, I think it's just because of the 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 area we are looking at for Sheffield is quite small, um, relatively quite small. So that the indirect damage it doesn't uh, doesn't do so well. And I have to say this is a within the boundary of the Sheffield, and uh, it doesn't account for the cascading effect outside of uh, Sheffield. We are working on that. It's not, uh, it's not finished yet. But looking within the Sheffield city, uh, Sheffield city boundaries, the, uh, the, the top figures give you the flood footprint. So the mark, the blue area, is the flood footprint uh, for the Sheffield regions. Uh, sorry, not Sheffield region, Sheffield cities, and uh, for the 2007 flooding, uh, which is about 500, uh, what's the figure about? Uh, 571 million, uh, three, four uh, percent. Sorry, almost seven percent of Sheffield's GVA. And uh, the other three parts give you a more breakdown analysis about uh, this. This uh, green line is the amount of uh, final consumption, basically household requirement we would require uh, uh, along the uh, recovery period. And this red line, it tells you without import, uh, within only relying on the Sheffield itself, how quickly they can recover. And this, uh, this uh, black dot is with import, with help of the importing. And, uh, how much we can get recovered quickly, and similarly we get for this for this picture it tells you the gap between the the local productive productivity and the consumption required. So there's always a gap until they fully recovered. Um, and um, I know I probably uh, uh, I need uh, two more minutes trying to run this uh, uh, another case we are doing for. Central European countries for flooding in 2009. So there was a f uh, four four countries was uh, involved was a big flooding in 2009, relatively big flooding uh, in Czech Republic, Germany, Austria, and Poland. And uh, the, on the right, this is the map where, where the, uh, the the flooding happened. And this it tells you the direct losses for the four countries. So the total losses is a 356 million euros in that uh, um, in, uh, for, for this is uh, basically it's the uh, coming from the Munich Re uh, doc, um, data set. Uh, flood footprint for 2009 again it takes roughly 15 months to recover for those region for those um, uh, countries and the regions. And the distribution for the flood footprint between the countries, Austria was about 600, and the Czech Republic and the Germany are pretty much equal, is around 400 million euros. And Poland is uh, slightly small. And if we break down the flood footprint for each country by different regions, uh, we can see in Austria the, large, the, 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 uh, the largest, like the impact, the largest footprint among the Austrian regions is uh, Vienna. And uh, so they are almost took half of the total, or maybe one third of the total of the uh, the Austrian total output, uh, the total footprint. Uh, I think the the total damage for Aus for the Austria case was around one percent of the uh, of the national uh, national GDP for the Austria, and the Germany was a uh, less. Than half percent, 0.4 maybe percent for the for the Germany, or even less probably, um, because the Germans, um, uh, yeah, have the somewhere else uh, in the in the in the document. And uh, as I said, we can break down the flood footprint by sectors for in these uh, European cases uh, for each different sectors and then uh, you know measure by different countries. Uh, so we, you know, we, we, we gave the sector uh, distributions for damages. Uh, most are in the um, in the manufacturing sectors, and also construction sectors got impacted quite heavily. 
uh, uh, followed by the service business uh, sectors like professional services, IT services, etc. Uh, yeah, uh, I, that's the. Uh, we can also uh, what we we also did, which I didn't present it here, is to take, for example, take Vienna as a as a case study to look more closely to uh, to the breakdown for the sectors and the regions for for Vienna to look at the flood. Uh Yes, I think I'm uh, almost uh, already over the time. And do you have any questions? Um, please let me know. So I'm going to just uh, stop here. Uh, once again, uh, sorry about the, uh, you know, uh, earlier the technical issues. My microphone doesn't work. I'm not sure why, but uh, yeah. If you have questions, and uh, it seems, huh? no, no. Well, okay. I repeat the question: uh, Is a 15-month recovery period a standard time for most places to recover from the flood? Actually, no. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, the 2007 flood in the U.S., uh, the Environmental Agency uh, statement was. Um, uh, was and uh, 20 months. I think the, everybody uh, go back to home and uh, they got, got to their, their their residential because the residential is mostly delay the the last thing. Uh, well, they take a long time to to get recovered uh, to be uh, shaped up to the original standard. So environment agency says uh, give the indication is that 20 months are fully recovers. Of course, uh, this is based on. Um, in terms of my understanding, is based on estimations, and our our results uh, for the flood footprint actually um, modeled quite a, quite match their estimation. It was a 20 months. Uh, they are almost fully recovered back to business zero. But this is only for Sheffield case. <coughs> Um, and then for the other regions, we we did uh, 2007 um, for the whole Yorkshire regions, and that is less than 20 months. Was about I think 15, 16 months. And uh, we also trying to run another uh, uh, study for the for the storms in uh, I think uh, 2006 storms in the Central European countries. That's only take roughly 10 months, 13 months to to get it recovered. So it's it's not um, it's depending how big the damage is. The the more damage you got and a, a more direct damage you get and a more uh, it seems the more cascading effects you can you can you can um, you would get and a longer period to fully recover back to to the things. Uh, there's another question. What's the difference between the GVA and the GDP in terms of flood footprint? So that's the economic uh, uh, terms. So when we talk about uh, uh, GVA, this stands for uh, gross value added. Basically, if you talk about the city or, or regions, you use the GVA. Uh, population is a similar. It's pretty much similar to GDP, but GDP is gross domestic productions. Yearly is used as a, uh, for the as a national or large regional level, and for small, well, like say relatively small uh, city regions like in Sheffield, we 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 tend to use the GBAs. There's no official publications saying that what what's the GDP for for G, uh, for Sheffield. It's only GBAs.
uh, there's another question. Why are the uh, flood footprint losses for Sheffield so much higher than the European floods in 2009? Um, uh, to be honest, the, the, the two cases are not, a com uh, it's not uh, co comparable, to be honest. The, this, it's not uh, uh, because of the uh, a, a small, uh, a city regions and the, the uh, it's a two different events. And uh, the direct damage for, from the uh, uh, Environment Agency report for Sheffield um, is, um, is, is a lot higher than any regions we have in the European uh, countries. Again, that can be uh, accounting issues. So uh, if you work at the flood models and you can see the direct damage can range for, you know, big ranges. The uh, direct damage for, for Sheffield was 295 million pounds already. And uh, the total damage for the flooding in the, in the, uh, the four countries Four countries. I'm not saying the four countries are all being flooded. You know, the flooded regions was only 356. This is coming from Munich Re. This is the insurance insurance database, and uh, this figure is coming from environmental agency report, and the calculation can be can be can be quite different. We understand that there's a huge, um, as I said different data sets or different data present different things. We, at the moment, we can't really, we haven't got into the details about the, uh, like say, there's no standard for calculating direct damage, although there's a pro protocol for doing that, but it's no actual standard, uh, the framework to, to, to calculate the direct damage. Uh, different uh, different uh, insurance company has a different, uh, different uh, accounting methods, uh, so again, from, from the environment agency perspective, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's quite different to the, uh, uh, the insurance company use. So uh, we can't directly uh, directly compare this. Only thing we can we would uh, would be nice to compare is the uh, the like the percentage of losses uh, in terms of GDP or GBA regional GBA, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you, you, you enjoy my talk, and if you, want, you have uh, further questions, please let me know. Just send me an email. I try to respond, yeah, you know, uh, respond to you as quick as I can. Okay, thank you, everyone.